Today my guest is Gary Schneider. Gary is an entrepreneur who has started many businesses. Although he's trying to retire now from his contracting business, but under his belt are businesses of landscaping, glass, property owner of rentals, jewelry and silver, excuse me, jewelry, silver and goldsmith. Uh, Gary has been married to his wife Deborah for 48 years and enjoys travel. So welcome to the show today, Gary. Yes, I enjoy being here. <laughs> it's good to have you. So for those that don't know you, let's start with your background and give us a little bit more information about you. I was born here in Portland, Oregon okay. and uh, grew up on uh, right off of Hague Street by St. Ignatius Church off of Powell. Okay. Uh, my dad built the house in 1948 and uh, went to Franklin and we went to some other, um, this called kind of art places, schools, things that just my interest. Mm -hmm. And I kept finding myself coming back to um, basically um, jewelry making. I actually, to give you an idea of how I really got started in that, I uh, went to Franklin. My first year, freshman, I took an art metal class. That's what they called it. But actually, it was a jewelry class. Mm -hmm. And that's when I first learned how to be an entrepreneur with my uncle's help, who owned a car lot. So I sold cars for him. Okay. And detailed them. Oh, okay. He taught me a lot about business. And he could read people like you wouldn't believe. For example, I would say, hey, a customer's coming in. Can I go out and talk to him? He said, no, don't bother. He's just kicking tires. Oh. He could read people. Yeah, yeah. And he taught me that. Yeah. So back to high school, as when I was in high school, I basically took the first year of art metal. And what they had me do, the teacher, Trotta, he was a neat guy, he was a Hawaiian, hmm. big dude. <laughs> and uh, he would he'd come to me, he said, Gary, what are you doing? He, I said, well, you guys, everybody's working in copper and brass. I said, you know, I want to work in silver. He says, well, you know, that's expensive. Now, silver back then was like a buck fifty an ounce. <laughs> and that's expensive. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The seventies. My how times have changed. Yeah. So um, I started um, making silver rings out of quarters. Wow. They were eighty percent silver. Wow. And I would sell them to the teachers, <laughs> and they would buy them. <laughs> and and so my my teacher he goes, Wow, Gary. Um, I said, can I keep doing this? He says, yeah. So I started, what happened by my, uh, be my sophomore year, he came to me and he said, Gary, you just got a knack for this. Would you be my assistant? Wow. So I, all four years I worked there mm. and took that class. It was my favorite class. Wow. I used to go in after school. Wow. Because I'd make my stuff and then sell it. <laughs> and so, um, so my yeah, I don't know very many people in high school that started a business. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So basically what happened was um, in my junior year, my later in my junior year, I went, hmm, if I can sell, you know, these rings for five, six, seven bucks and I got a quarter in them. <laughs> so I said, you know, I'm going to make stuff out of gold. Okay. So I started making some, um, I did a lot of fabrication. I did casting. But I made up some... Um, gold rings and a friend of mine was that he used to live behind me he went down to Mexico and got these fire agates mm. they're really cool stones yeah and so he'd bring them back and I started setting those in gold wow and you guys I was getting a hundred and twenty bucks for them that was a lot back then yeah <laughs> and that wow. went further and further kept doing it and then I didn't want to graduate because I was going to lose my shop. <laughs> <laughs> so a new teacher came in, and he allowed me to come back after I um, graduated. Wow. And use the shop wow. in the evenings. And I was teaching him. That's crazy. <laughs> wow. But that's how this entrepreneurship started. Okay. In with my uncle and selling cars. Yeah. I mean, um, I never really wanted for money. It, it was so just, you really enjoyed what you did. Yeah. yeah, and selling cars. I'll give you an example. My uncle would pay me in cash. And I'd sometimes sell cars on his lot 
but I'd take them to high school and sell them. Oh, wow. And one day he came up to me and he said, good job, Barry. And he handed me, listen to this, guys, <laughs> $500 bill. Wow. That's a lot back then. I mean, $500 bill. <laughs> People don't, they don't exist. I said, yes, they do. Yeah, yeah. And I said, what's that for? He said, yeah, you know, you're my nephew. And, wow. And so that's how that started. So um, as time went on and I finally got out of um, you know, that, I started my own shop at home. Mm -hmm. in a rental property okay and I had it in my garage where I was and I was doing that for probably eight years nine years and then if anybody remembers <laughs> 1990 okay. Gulf War okay it put a lot of people out of business mm. and one of my businesses which was a jewelry business kind of went mm. went down and so I said, okay, what am I going to do now? You know, my wife was working at Fred Meyers, and, and basically we were just getting by, you know, like most young couples. Yeah. And so basically my bread and butter kind of went away. And so I go, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I remember praying about it, and um, right in the midst of all that, some crazy thing happened. Um, my wife's sister that just had a baby died. Mm. from a brain aneurysm mm. and in the meantime the place where we were living for almost 11 and a half years um, I wanted to buy it okay but I wasn't very smart listen up people <laughs> get, listen and learn huh? get a contract <laughs> and so what I did is I didn't get a contract um, they said they'd sell it to me for $35,000 mm. and I basically took me six months to get approved. I mean, I didn't, I seem self-employed, you know, wife yeah, has, right. and yeah. so I finally got approved, and then I went to them, and said, I'm approved, and they said, well, we changed my, my mind. They changed their mind. Yeah. They want 45,000. Yeah. So I couldn't do it. So then they gave me a 30-day notice. Gosh. And in the meantime, I'll go back. While I was there, this really got me, people. When I went back to them and talked to them about this, when they gave me a 30-day notice, I'm going, come on, you know, and, but I didn't have a contract, yeah. so I had to find a place to live, moved in with my, um, my wife's parents, which lived just down the street. Which is very humbling, I'm sure. Yeah, in the back bedroom, <laughs> and the golf war is going on, mm. and then during that time, her sister passed. Mm. So we thought we'd be there only maybe six months, seven, eight months. It was 16 months. And so the little boy, Dalton, basically moved close to them, and we helped raise him that mm. first few years. So in, in the midst of all this, I was a believer, and I was growing in the Lord, and I was reading Galatians, the book of Galatians. Come on, I, this, I really want people to hear this. The book of Galatians taught me about co-heirships with the king of glory. Mm -hmm. I like to call him the great I am. Mm -hmm. And he said, Gary, you're an only child. You are an heir to me and naturally to my mom. My dad had passed away in 82. Mm. And I, I was going, wow, Lord, what are you showing me? He said, Gary, you have not because you've not asked. I'll never forget that. So I went to my mom and said, Mom, can I borrow $30,000? <laughs> and she said, yes. Wow. <laughs> I was managing her money because my dad passed away. My mom really didn't know what to do with the money. Now, there was high inflation back then, okay. and the time CDs were going for 13-plus percent. So I moved some of the money into that and moved some money into mutual funds. And that's how I started learning about this. And so basically she passed away basically in 1994, 95, right in there. And I, air, I was, the house was mine. And so what I did is I had enough understanding of being there with my father-in-law watching cable, which to this day, by the way, I don't have. <laughs> um, but I watched some programs that taught me about real estate and about one of the things that surprised me is duplexes were going for 
about the same price per square foot than a single family home. And at first I said, that don't make sense. You know what? It's almost still the same way today. Hmm. So I decided to buy a duplex and that's how I got started buying rental property. And it just bloomed after that, bought more. Um, and also, you didn't say, but your father was a carpenter, correct? My dad was a master carpenter. Yeah. Uh, so you got some of that training under your belt growing up. Oh, definitely. really helped you. Yeah. My, we remodeled my upstairs. And um, one of the things my dad, he was a master carpenter. When it came to wood, he could do anything with it. Mm. I mean, he built the old type. I mean, mm -hmm. the corridors and all the carvings. Mm. My dad, wow. he would use planes, by hand planes. Wow. So I learned all that, you mm. know. and But... There's things that he didn't like. He didn't like drywall, he didn't like electricity, and he didn't like plumbing. So you got those jobs. Yeah. <laughs> but I became a good drywaller. Yeah. And that's kind of how I started in basically 93 when I started my construction business because everything kind of went sideways. I needed to find something to do when I was living in the duplex. I remodeled the duplex before I moved in, and then I ended up remodeling the, the, the next size. Now, this is interesting. Remember the time frame. This was uh, back... In the early night, you know, night 2000, well, it's 1993, yeah, right in there. When I moved in in 92, two of 92, actually, I remember it, paid 73.5 for this place, fixed it up. Nine years later, I sold it for $225,000. It's a nice return. Plus, I had all that money coming in from the rentals, right. which went up to 700 bucks. Wow. So I didn't have house payments during that nine years. Nice. Guess what I did with the money? Invested? Yes. <laughs> You're very wise. <laughs> so why I share this, because it's part of my testimony, but God was in the midst of all of this. Mm -hmm. He was guiding me, showing me, teaching me. Um, I mean, when I was reading the book of Galatians, he just said, Gary, you're co-heirs with me. Oh, I, I just remembered a vision he gave me. He showed me a room. Imagine this room with a bunch of shelves all the way around it. On the shelves were my giftings. Wow. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, why has it got cobwebs and yeah. dust all over it? Wow. And he said, Gary, you're not asking. Wow. I'll never forget that. That's when the Lord just brought it to my memory. Wow, yeah, that's quite a vision. Yeah, it was a vision. And I, <laughs> so I said, so what do you want me to do? You weren't born into a carpenter's, being a carpenter's son by accident. Then he showed me the scripture, your footsteps are ordered. Mm -hmm. So I started just believing that. I said, okay, Lord, what are we going to do? Duplex happened, then other things happened. I've watched him just guide me. Mm. But in the midst of all of that, I've had a lot of things happen that could have killed me. And I know it was the enemy. Mm -hmm. I know it. Yeah. And I know it more now than ever. And so is it okay if I flip forward for a little bit here? Yeah. I want to go to what everybody just went through, COVID-19. Okay. Okay. Been about, it's been actually, my wife said it was about a year ago to today, yesterday. Mm. And uh, I said, that's kind of ironic that I'm doing this. Yeah. Right. And what is interesting, I'll put this out there. The Lord told me that I would be doing something like this way back 10 years ago. Mm. And it's interesting, the last year, he said, this is the year. And I didn't put this together. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm Cheryl, saying, Cheryl called you up and said, hey, yeah. let's, let's connect. And, Out of the blue. Yeah, that's true. You know, and, yeah. and I knew immediately, the Lord said to me, this is it, Gary. Wow. And so why I say that is I want to encourage people out there. You might not know God is working on you and working mm -hmm. with you, but he is. Right. That's good. He never stops. Yes. That's so good. You know? So back to where I was, short-term memory, where I was. <laughs> You're fine. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to really have people understand that. And so as time goes on, he keeps doing these things. Now back to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is not one of about seven I'd say six encounters over my lifetime with the Lord. Two of them that I had, one was in 97 when he actually took me to a place. Mm. Um, I didn't know what it was for quite some time until the Lord, I asked him, 
And this is just the last couple of years. I said, Gary, what was that place? Now, here's what he told me. I was sitting in a theater watching a movie. He said, Gary, he just kind of tapped me on the shoulder in my spirit. He said, Gary, I took you to a celestial theater room mm. in heaven. I went, oh, it made so much sense. Wow. And he takes a lot of people there. Hmm. We see it in the Word. Hmm. John wrote the book of Revelation. True. That's true. You know, and yeah. he just reminded me of all the different people. Of wow. Paul. Yeah. Saul. Paul. I, I go, wow. And he says, Gary, I'm going to let you know I'm doing this more and more in this age to mm. people. And so he, that's one of the things that he showed me. And um, I was really, I kind of chuckled because that prophesied in 97, prophesied my heart surgery, okay, in 2012. Hmm. Sometime and maybe in the future I could go into detail on that, but it, it is, it's crazy. Um, because that would be something I'd like to people to understand that God's got it. That's my favorite saying. I say it all the time now. <laughs> and he's directing our path, yeah. even though you don't think so. Yeah, no, that's good. And he has a timing for everything. Yeah, he does. So yeah. He does. Um, and I, I felt Lord right now sharing me to share this. I struggled with one thing in my Christianity. Okay. One was I struggled with um, the word is predestined. Okay. Okay. I go, Lord, I just can't. I, I struggled with it. I, mm -hmm. how, how predestined? How can that be? Mm -hmm. But yet we're free will beings. Right. And one day, in the middle of the night, gave me a vision and, and an encounter, and he explained it to me. Now listen to this. <laughs> he said, Gary, you're a carpenter. I said, yes. You, you've set how many doors? I mean, in houses, I've set so many doors and trimmed them out, gained them count. And I said, yeah, Lord. He said, now I'm going to show you something. So he said, okay, Gary, I want you to go through number one door. And you're stubborn, <laughs> self-will. You go through two. So I go through two, and it wasn't a good door to go through. Mm. Okay? Mm. But... This is what happened. He said, Gary, who was on the other side of that door? Mm. Yeshua was, the king of glory. And he took me through like four doors of my life, mm. showing me each time I didn't do what he asked me to do. Wow. And I went through the other door. Chaos. <laughs> yeah, I talk, good analogy. Yeah. I'll never oh, yeah. forget it yeah. because he basically showed me, and he said, one day I was got more mature, and, de and the Lord said, I want you to go through door for number one. Okay, Lord, let's go. <laughs> and that's kind of how my life was. Was I could see the events. Yeah. He kind of showed him to me. Mm. And he showed me, though, that he was there through all of them. Wow. But it was my will. See? Right. Oh, yeah. That changed me because I started realizing that when he asked me to do something, I'm like, go for it. Yeah, obedience is better than sacrifice, sacrifice. right? Yes. And uh, I know, I think everybody could say at some point in their life that they didn't listen to the Lord, and, and somehow we think we can help him. Exactly. Right? We have the better plan, and we, you know, and I'm sure he sits in the heavens and laughs. That's no, I'm, I'm serious. I laugh scripture. with him. <laughs> but it's like, you know, sometimes we argue with the Lord, and we're like, you mm -hmm. know, I, I just, I think you could, you could help me here. This would be good. You know, no, he knows what's best. He and knows, and he's the great I am. <laughs> right. You know, I really learned that uh, over yeah. the years, you know, and because of that preparation um, that he's done over the years, I believe I've, um, like I said, I've had uh, almost like four different life ending possibilities. He just reminded me of one yesterday mm. that I'd forgotten about. Mm. This was way back when I was, you guys, I'm gonna be honest with you out there, I was a hippie <laughs> born in the 70s. Yeah. And I did stuff that, Probably shouldn't be doing. I'll just say it that way. But I used to um, like r race cars. And because I had money, 
I had built myself a race car, dragster almost like. Oh, wow. It was a small car that had 450 horsepower and I pulled the wheels off the ground. Wow. Well, I almost killed myself in that car. Listen up. <laughs> 82nd, you got to remember, back oh, in the yeah. 70s, yeah. there wasn't the traffic like there is now. Yeah. And I was racing a gentleman down the road, mm. and a car pulled out in front of me. Oh, gee. I was doing probably 115. Oh, my goodness. To this day, I don't know how I didn't hit him. I hit the brakes, slid sideways, and I turned around. I'd gone past where the car was. And it wasn't there. Mm. Come on. Wow, that's crazy. It was crazy. It's squared, squared that crap out of me. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. I said, whoa, Lord. I mean, I, 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 like I said, I wasn't a really strong believer back then. Right. But my grandma had planted the seed yeah. in me when she was alive. Yeah. And I, uh, I'll never forget it. And the Lord reminded me of that today for mm. this. Wow. That was the first wake-up call for me. And so I started kind of talking to the Lord, just just talking with him. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't have all this other stuff in the religious because I hadn't been in church. Mm -hmm. And then I started going to church um, in a very, um, how can I put it, Lord, conservative to the max. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't even preach on Corinthians 12, 13, 14, 15. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Book of Acts, they very seldom touched that. And so I just said, Lord, what's this all about? And I was, I'll be honest, it's kind of part of my rebel in me. I would go up to the pastor and I'd say, well, why don't you teach on this? <laughs> you know, wearing a little zigzag man on my collar. <laughs> and so I, I kind of badgered him. Yeah. And he just said, well, I made a pact. I go, with who? <laughs> Western Seminary Baptist Church. I made a pact not to teach on it. So it's, you kind of see how the Lord took me? Yeah. So I, so I basically said to myself, I'm going to dig into this more. So now this is an interesting, one of the interesting testimonies. It has mm -hmm. to do with my father. Okay. My dad ended up getting prostate cancer. Mm. Okay. And I was um, still living, you know, basically over there at the... Uh, the rental property, and it was quite the hard times. And I actually, just so you know, my actually, my dad died in nine eight eighty two, mm. um, and we were close. Only child, carpenter, worked yeah, with him. Yeah, right. And that really threw me for a loop. Yeah. But listen to this though, we got to go back a while, to about seventy eight or so or before that, even a little further back. He was di diagnosed with um, prostate cancer. Went in and had the surgery, and they came out. I'll never forget it. They closed him up and said, it's metastasized. There's nothing going to do. He has mm. six months to live. Oh, gee. And I just went, uh, my, my mom and myself, we were just devastated. And, um, but I was going to a, a fellowship back then. I'd switched to more of a, I was just in the process of switching to more of a Pentecostal type church, AG church. Mm hmm through um, Young's uh, Men Bible Study. Okay. And that's when I started learning about the prayer language and praying in the Spirit and all that. And so... Um, AG, for those listening that may not know, is Assembly, Assembly of, of God. God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what took place during that is... Um, I'll never forget this. His name is Eric Shaler. He was a six-foot-three, white-haired man. He was in the hospital with my dad. Mm. And I was, at that time, was a believer, but I was still pretty new. And um, so I got to know Eric and everything, and they did the thing, and so they found out that he, they couldn't operate on him. And so they s sent him home. Well, I didn't know that Eric had been praying with him. Mm. My dad, I actually, a lot, I, the Lord used me to help lead my dad to the Lord. Okay. That's great. Me too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, but it wasn't that big a deal to me, but I just, I was talking about all this stuff that's been happening. And my dad's looking at me like I'm crazy, <laughs> you know, because my parents weren't believers. They weren't going okay. to church. Okay. And so what happened was, what was interesting is Eric, he had been praying for my dad mm -hmm. and he went to this church in Milwaukee and that's where he was attending. And he believed in proxy. 
You know what that is? Okay. Yes, but explain it. Well, me. what it is is a person stands in for somebody else. Right. They go up, lay hands on them, yeah. and pray that they'll be healed. Yes. My dad was healed. Wow. I didn't know it until later. I'll explain wow. this. This was, See, the Lord had been showing me things. So we, I, we switched churches. We happened to end up by chance going to that church. I looked over, and there's Eric in the mm. pew next to me. Wow. He looked at me. I said, hi. I mean, I was just like, whoa. Yeah. And he goes, hey, how's your dad doing? And I go, well, how do you know he's alive? I knew he was healed. Wow. And this was two years, three years later. Wow. And I go, I just said, wow, too. I was mean, just out of sorts. And he explained what he had done. And that's where I had my first vision of the Lord. And this was about mm. in 80. To, mm -hmm. When I started going there, I, there was an altar call, and I went up there to be prayed for and, and hands laid on me. I wanted more of the Lord. And you know in Isaiah where the, they, who was it that saw the Lord high and lifted up his train fills the temple? Isaiah. Isaiah. Yeah. That, what happened? I saw that. Wow. And let me explain it a little bit. Um, it, the glory is his veil, his glory, his light. It's, it, it's colorful. It looked like sparkling diamonds. Now remember, nice. I'm a goldsmith. I yeah. set diamonds. Yeah, nice. I just about, I kind of just like about fell over. I mean, I was just like, whoa. Wow. Did that really happen? Mm. And the Lord just spoke and says, yes, Gary, I'm showing you who I am. Mm. The word I am. I wrote a song once, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, saying I'm his princess and I said and I, every time it's like the words came out of my mouth and I can I say that and what part of it said was he clothes me with diamonds and jewels mm -hmm. but I'm That's like give me a chill you know <laughs> and I'm like but every time and I'm like well why not if you know yeah. anyway but yeah that's what his, that would make sense that's what his veil looked like Wow Wow. Um, you know, that's, I, when I talk about it, I still see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So those are things that kind of happen as time goes on. And, mm. But in the midst of that, and I just, I just know from just this last thing, and I'm going to flip forward to COVID-19 about a year ago. Okay. Um, I got COVID-19. Um, we actually were heading over to my property to do some work on it. When I got over there, I wasn't feeling really good. I thought, eh, maybe I got a cold. Well, it kept getting worse and getting worse. Mm -hmm. And so um, we tried calling around before we left here in Portland, but we couldn't find anybody to give me a COVID test. It was mm -hmm. that early in the outbreak. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I get over there, and we're in Redmond, and uh, Deb got on her phone, and we found a place, and they, they were doing the COVID test. We actually drove up. And they, we did the COVID test, and I had COVID. Deb didn't. She was negative. Okay. So I proceeded to continue to do the work I needed to do, which was stupid. <laughs> yeah. Gee. And I was getting sicker and sicker. And so um, she drove home. When I got home, we took my temperature, and I was pushing 103. I was getting the COVID lung. Mm. Okay. Then listen to this. See, Ed Rowley. Ed, if you're out there someday, this is you, <laughs> brother. He's like a brother I never had. We grew up together. Okay. Went through high school and stuff. Okay. Okay. Anyways, he basically okay. was in the service. He was in Desert Storm, and he was a PA. Mm. Well, he, after the service, he became a PA, like a doctor. And he's actually back east. And uh, he, through social media, he saw that I had COVID. So he called me up. And called my wife and talked to him and said, Gary, you got to get Gary to get to this motor chloride um, infusion as fast as possible. And so um, we tried to find it. We couldn't find it. And then Ed called back. I called him and said, I can't find it. He says, go to OHSU. Call them. They did it. In fact, a lot of hospitals were, were saying, I don't know work. Hmm. You know, they wouldn't do it. Yeah. But H OHSU did. Went up there and basically... They gave me this infusion. It was almost an hour drip. Wow. I became 
violently shaking, like chills. And I, and and the guy there was that was doing. He said, "Wow, maybe we maybe should um, you know have you stay here, t put you into ICO, you know." And I said, "No, no, no." And I was praying in the spirit, and I was just, I just, I just felt the Lord just, just take, go for it, stay, stay, you know. Yeah. And so um, about forty minutes passed, and it started to go and get better, and the chills started going away, my fever started coming down, and I, I so I went home. Well, when I got home, I had some more events where I, my lungs were getting more and more congested and I was getting hard to breathe, my oxygen level. We have an oximeter. We always had all that because mm -hmm. of my background with surgeries and stuff. Okay. And we took my oximeter and it was down to 80. Hmm. And we called the hospital, Adventus, where my, we actually had insurance with, and um, they said, get me up there. So they put me into a COVID ward, yeah. ICU, a HEPA filter in the room, and people were coming in with gear yeah. on. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, during that time. And um, and I wasn't doing that great. And um, of course, this, this, this actually happened, people. They came in and they wanted to put me on a ventilator. I said, no way, it ain't happening. When I asked the Lord about doing the shot way back when, he told me no, mm -hmm. okay? And so I was getting a lot of hassles from people because I wouldn't take the shot, mm -hmm. my wife too. But it was, I just kept asking, I said, no, Gary, I don't want you to do it. And so I didn't. And so what happened was, is that I woke up on the third day, two, I remember the time, I looked over at about 2.30 in the morning, woke up and I was suffocating. And I mean, I was suffocating. And I just went like this. I said, Lord, if it's time for me to come home, here I am. Mm. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, Gary, remember the book Gazing into Glory, which I have given you? Yes. <laughs> he said, remember, you've been practicing this. You've been learning about the glory. You know, John 17, 22, by the way. <laughs> um, and how to release it and, and um, learn how to use it. Because I had had some experiences before this, laying hands on one lady, and I'm kind of going to make some of this short. Um, Lord had me go up and lay hands on her, and I laid hands on her and prayed over her, and then I left. I'd been the Lord had been having me go to different fellowships for about two years, and just standing in the back and praying in the Spirit and releasing the glory. That's what He asked me to do. Mm -hmm. But this one day, He wanted me to go up to this person, didn't know her, walked past me, and He said, "I want you to go pray for that." So I, I said, okay. So I went up to her and I introduced myself and I, I was honest with her. I said, um, my name's Gary. The Lord told me to come up and pray for you. And uh, she said, she looked at me, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll receive it. And I said, but I'm, I, I was honest with her. I said, I'm going to pray in a different language. I wanted her to know. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, whatever you need to do, do it. <laughs> That's what she said to me. Yeah. And so... I went over and laid hands on her, started praying in the Spirit and releasing the glory over her. And I didn't realize that her husband was sitting next to her. Mm. And so the Lord just said, you're done. And I, I, I said, the Lord, I, I think it's taken care of, just like that. And I introduced myself when I left and went back. And then COVID hit just about a week, two weeks later. I went back. She was there. Mm. No walker. Praise God. And the Lord, she, they looked at me, and they saw me, and they, go, they were like this. Come, 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 come. Wow. And I went up to her, and I go, well, what? I was totally healed. <laughs> I said, hallelujah. We had yeah. a little dance there. Yeah, no kidding. And I don't even remember her name. It was just, mm. and I just, I go, so wow, Lord. And, and she just goes, and they start, here's what they her husband got up and started shaking my hand, and, and they're starting to praise me. And I said, no, no. Yeah. This was the king's work. I was the instrument. Good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we're just the conduit. Yes. We just have to be the willing vessel to pray. Yeah. Amen. And, I, and they just said, but we want to thank you. Thank you for being obedient. Mm. And I left. And uh, she was healed. Of what, what it was is four stage cancer. She only six months to live. Wow. That is miraculous because cancer, I mean, a lot of people are healed of different things, but cancer is sometimes a big Yeah, I got a friend who's going through it right now mm -hmm. with his wife. 
But I know what God can do. I saw it. And so when, God, yeah. when God tells me to go do yes. something for somebody, be obedient. I'm obedient. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of signs and wonders these last few years, people. Mm. They're real. Yeah. Amen. And he wants to do more. Amen. And you need to learn about the glory. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell us one of your, you haven't told us some of your God encounters yet. No, I won't. I, okay. I'm going to flip back to the one that happened in 97. Okay. 97 was an interesting year. I was going to, uh, well, I'm just going to say it was Foursquare Church. Okay. Okay. And they were having really great revival. The Spirit was moving. People are getting slayed in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, this happened. I was in my bedroom at about 2.33 in the morning. That seems like when it stuff keeps happening when I talk to the Lord. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I wasn't in my bed anymore. I was standing in the celestial room, theater room. I was on a bench, and it was all made out of marble, and the Lord was sitting right next to me. And he said, look at the, that wall. I said, yeah, it looks like a mausoleum. That's what it looked like. Yeah. Okay? On the wall were all these different things. Some of them I could read and understand. Some of them I didn't. Mm. And I go, what is this? He says, that's the curses from the enemy. Mm. Fear, doubt, anxiety. Just Some of them I could make out. Some were in a language I couldn't make out. Interesting. And he said, this is the wall that I want to break. And I go, wow, why am I here? He says, because I'm calling you to be a spokesperson. I go, what? <laughs> what, do you, what, do you t what do you mean? He says, <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to be honest with you. He said, I want you to be like Aaron was to Moses. I went, what? I mean, I still to this day, I just like, yeah, right. I mean, I'll be, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, listen to this. This is crazy, guys. He said, I want you to stand up in front of me and prophesy to that wall. Mm. Now, this is what's interesting, guys, because this happened in 90, 1997, 90, mm -hmm. right in there. Mm -hmm. And to my left was a gurney mm. with a person on it with a sheet over it. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't see who was laying there. Mm -mm. But mm -hmm. I kind of knew. I go, that, I hope that's not me. <laughs> I right. mean, yeah. I'm serious. Right, right. I was looking at that, and there was like light going in and out. Hmm. And I was going, whoa. And I kept looking over that. And, of course, the Lord's here. And I'm going, what's this all about? Mm -hmm. So he had me stand up in front of him. And I said, Lord, I have no clue what to say. Hmm. He said, this is what he said to me. He said, Gary, you start speaking, and I will speak through you. Hmm. Well, there you go. And so I started prophesying to this wall in tongues, in different languages I'd never heard before. <laughs> and that wall started to break and crumble. Wow. And it started to move away out into, like, space. Mm. And then a huge light of God's glory just went. Wow. And I go, I said, wow, a lot of times. <laughs> and I, to this day, when I share it, I just, it's just like, yeah, you know? Yeah. But why I'm sharing that is that was prophesying basically 2012 when I ended up having a heart problem calling AFib. It was extreme. The doctors couldn't figure out why I had it because usually AFib comes from something wrong with a valve or cholesterol, or, you know, all mm -hmm, this other stuff. Mm -hmm. It's actually an electrical problem. And so... I'd been dealing with it for three or four years. Mm. And it got to a point where I couldn't even mow the lawn. My wife had to do everything. Praise her, thank her. And um, basically, I got to a point where I said, Lord, I can't live like this anymore. On all the medication that they were giving me, 
I ballooned up to 225 pounds. Wow. And then the Lord started intervening. He said, Gary, one night, woke me up again. He says, I want you to look up the word maze. He, back, they're still doing the ablations. Ablations is a common thing that they try to get rid of AFib, but you never get off the drugs, ever. And so I've never been really a computer person. Remember, I'm more of a carpenter <laughs> still. You know, having yeah. an iPhone now, I've only had it about eight months. <laughs> I'm being honest. <laughs> okay, right. You know? Yeah. And so, but I had a computer, and my wife did a lot of our bookkeeping, thank the Lord. And so I went in there, and I had Dragonette speaking on it, so I could speak to the computer. And I just said, the Lord said, why don't you ask what a full maze is? And so I did. And all of a sudden popped up three different places. Hmm. And I'm going, full maze? What's a maze? Because that's what I would say to the computer. And it showed me th this procedure. So I called the place that w was the closest one. There's one that could do the procedure in Palm Springs, where I used to play, well, I still play golf down there. And then there's one in Cincinnati, Ohio. It's called the Wolf Foundation. Hmm. And I called them, and they answered. They had a team, and I told them, what was going on, and they asked me certain questions. Number one, do you smoke? I said, no. Do you drink? No. Never have. At least cigarettes. <laughs> okay, and they said, that's good. Um, what kind of medication is on? I told them. And then he said, have you had an ablation? And I said, no, I won't have one. They said, good. Just, yes. Wow. And they said, so uh, it's a procedure. We can do it here. Um, and you have to be here for about three weeks, and we have to do all the tests, and da-da-da. Well, me being in business, how much? $250,000. Wow. Yeah. And it was out of network, so we would have to pay a lot of that. Wow. And I just said, Lord, come on, now you're sh telling me what to do. Yeah. But we, no way, can afford yeah. this. right. Wow. You know, so my wife's working at Adventist. She was a bereavement coordinator and all kinds of things. She was there 17 years. And uh, so my PC, which I'd had for 30 years, Dr. King, he had gone through all of this with me, mm. retired. We're the same age, mm. you know. And uh, so I said, wow. So I had to go to his go-away party. I just had to. And his wife was there. She, he worked in the, she worked in the office. It was kind of, he had a really nice practice. He had over 150 people. Mm. And it was packed, and I'm, it's a warm day, and I'm going. And Deb said, you sure you can go? I said, I'm going. <laughs> I'm going. Yeah. So I went there, and listen to this. This is crazy. This is how God works. You know, went to that. Had to stand in line, had to lean up against the building a few times, you know, and Deb was in line, got in, saw him, height and everything, and then I went over and leaned up against the wall because I was having a pretty bad day. Mm. And my wife had saw somebody that came over. It was one of their CEOs that Deb knew from Venice Hill. And so they're t chatting, and they looked over at me, and he, I remember pointing at me, is that your husband? And I heard him say, yeah, that's my husband. And he said, he don't look very good. <laughs> so she proceeded to tell, tell her, tell him, well, he's, he's has AFib, da, 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 and mm -hmm. we're looking for this procedure called the maze. Right. Now, this is crazy. So the CEO, Deb knows his name. I don't remember his name. But he said, you know what? We just hired a new chief of staff to run the robotic system. They put a robotic system for, and it had been sitting there for a year, not even being used. Wow. Well, guess what? He knows how to use it. So I was the first one on that operating table having the maze, full maze, which he hardly ever does. Yeah. Well, he hadn't done it before you had he? No, he had done them. Oh, okay. And he, do, he used a different way of doing it. It's, one uses... Um, he, he uses cryo, which is freezing. As so they go in through the, they have to collapse my lungs, stop my heart. That Gee. would freak my wife out. Yeah. Because I wanted the full maze. Because if I ever have AFib again, there's a little flap called the appendage. I wanted that out. 
But to do that, he had to stop my heart. Wow. And I said, I said, I was honest with the Lord. Crazy. Either I'm here or I'm there. Yeah. I can't live like this anymore. Yeah. And so what happened was is I had to talk the doctor into it. Because he, he started asking me questions. He said, how do you know all this stuff? I'm a person that researches stuff. Yeah. You know? And he basically said, wow, let's do it. My wife's freaking out. <laughs> and we, I bet. we did this 2012 in February on leap year. <laughs> <laughs> and I got, that's when I got to see the Lord the second time. The procedure was supposed to be an hour and a half on stopping my heart. It lacked one minute of three hours. He never would tell me. Okay. But I didn't really care because I, I was sitting with the Lord looking at me. Mm. And some crazy things happened during this time when I was with him. I could see through the walls. I could see angels praying over people, mm. laying hands on them. In the hospital. In the hospital. That's cool. Yeah. And, you know, this, at Venice, well, it's a, it was a, you know, believing I mean, a yeah, hospital, right, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and knew a lot of friends there, and um, we weren't Adventists, but, you know, they have a heart for the Lord, I can say that. Yeah. And watching that just blew me away. I actually had a couple nicknames that I, that I came out of that. When I woke up the next day, that, that I'll share a little bit of it, but while I was with the Lord, and I was, I was just in awe, I mean, this is something I can say. The kingdom's real. Mm -hmm. It's real. Mm -hmm. God's real. Yeah. And we're going there. <laughs> okay? Get to know it. <laughs> it's actually fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. It's actually fun. Because what, what took place during that time, I nicknamed it, I called it glory bombs. Hmm. I would see light come in and through the heavenly host and go through people. Hmm. And, and it was like the glory of God. It was just like, whoop. and I was looking through the walls and seeing it. Yeah. It just blew me away. Wow, that's cool. You know, and I'm going, wow, good Lord. And you know what? And people might not believe this, but everybody has heavenly hosts with them. Yeah, everybody has angels. I believe that, yes. I had, um, I'm gonna flip to something that happened after this procedure. Mm -hmm. I was learning how to walk in the glory. Mm -hmm. And I was new at it. And the Lord said to me, he said, Gary, you have the authority, because I'm in you and you're in me, to set heavenly hosts with different people. Think about that. I went, wow, really me? See, we don't worship angels. Right. We work with them. Right, right. Yeah. If you can't or aware of it. Yes. You know, and so basically what he had me do was, this, this is a little quick little side trip here because the Lord's reminding me of it. I pulled into a gas station over on, on Pow. Mm -hmm. It was one of the gas stations where you got to get out and go pay. Okay. Normally I don't do it, but the one across the street was packed. So I pulled in there, get out of my vehicle, start to walk past the front of my truck, and a guy almost knocks me over. And he's kind of, we'd call him like homeless now, but this is before that. And I kind of, my, my uh, flesh rose up, you know, and the Lord checked me. He said, no, Gary. <laughs> I'm being honest, you yeah, know. And right. I, you know, so I said, okay, Lord, okay. So I prayed. And so I walk into the store to pay. The same guy cut me off in line and almost knocked me over again. Wow. His flesh started rising up, and the Lord <laughs> checked me. And he said, Gary, I want you to pray in the Spirit and put your hands out and release the glory, hmm. just like that. Hmm. He was knocked to the floor. Wow. Without touching him. Not touching him. <laughs> he turned around and looked at me like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. and his change was everywhere. I mean, it was, he's picking it up. He's really disheveled, yeah. you know. <laughs> and he walked off. And I said, I said wow, Lord. He, he said, <laughs> now this is what the Lord said. He said, pray in the Spirit. Send an angel with them. Mm. 
that was a learning experience hmm. for me. So now, when I'm out driving, and the Lord gets my attention of people, I do that. That's cool. Very cool. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're down to five minutes. So, in that time frame, what would you like to share, and how would you like to pray at the end of that? Well, I want you to know who I'm speaking to out there, that God loves you beyond your comprehension. He's let me know that. He would not have one perish, not one. I'm quoting scripture here. And I'm telling you, he's always working on it. So, Father, I thank you for this time that I'm sharing here. I hope it touches people's hearts, touches their mind and their spirit, mm -hmm. that they would hear that you're loved in spite of all the stuff that you're going through. He's there. And it's as simple like that thief on the cross. Mm -hmm. Hey, Lord, remember me. I want to know you. And watch what he'll do. For my power and glory is in every being that loves me, and you can do all things through Christ. Mm -hmm. Walk in it and see my glory and my care. In your name the King of glory, the great I am, Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Wow, <laughs> this has been really good. <laughs> wow, thank you for your time today, Gary. I really appreciate it. Thank you for letting me to do this. And the Lord told me that this was the day that he told me about. That Just it's time to get it out to the body. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, signs and wonders yes. are going to continue to increase. Yeah, That's something I realize as I'm reading through the book of Acts over and over. He always did signs and wonders. Then he shared. That's good. Very good. So it comes back down to that simple obedience when the yes. Lord tells you to reach out and pray for somebody, right? Yeah. Um, or whatever he tells you to do. Oh. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know... Uh, giving a bottle of water or, you know, something that you've baked or whatever. You know, the Lord uses everything that you do for His glory. And it's good. And yeah, when I go for walks in my neighborhood, I release the glory, right? Keep doing it. And I'm <laughs> telling you, I have a lady to cross the street. I don't know testimony. Uh, her has, husband has passed. He was a service man, but he had a lot of ADD and everything from the war and stress and all that. And he yeah. wasn't a very nice man. In fact, he used to yell at me. And, and so this went on for years. Mm -hmm. I've lived there 23 years. Mm -hmm. And he passed. And her, her name's Penny. And Penny was, is his wife. And come to find out, she was a believer. Oh, and, okay. And I... I offered to uh, take care of her yard, and so I'm still doing that. I did it for uh, well, a couple of years. Yeah, you know? see, it's just an act of kindness Kind of, yeah, it was just, right? yeah. yeah. And so we started opening up, ended up building a deck, building a new fence for her. Wow. And, and while we were over there in the back on our patio one day, um, we were praying, and uh, Keith and I, my partner, and she said, can I pray with you? And so we started praying together. And by the time we are done, all three are praying in the Spirit. My neighbor that I known for years mm. nice yeah but you're right divine divine yeah god does things like that mm -hmm. well this has been so good and i pray that you receive something today that you've never thought about before maybe uh opened you up a little bit more spiritually to think about some things and encourage mm -hmm. you uh in some new ways so uh, I love you, and until the next God Encounters, friends, stay blessed. Amen.